Hey everyone, my name is Sean and in today's video we're going to talk about playing through disruption. Uh, one of the big differences between, from Link Evolution from Legacy of the Duelist is how strong people's boards can be on turn 1. And so in order to counter how crazy people's boards can be and uh, give yourself an actual chance to play the game, one thing that you actually want to consider using are hand traps. Now hand traps are not necessarily anything new, in fact we've had hand traps since the original version of Yu-Gi-Oh like Karibo. But we're not going to really focus on some of these older cards and we're going to only focus on ones which allow you to stop your opponent from building up crazy amount of resources and that you can use on turn 1 to kind of stop them from playing. Uh, so let's get into a quick description of um, what some of these are and how you can defend yourself against uh, your opponent's form of disruption on turn 1. The first group of cards we're going to talk about are hand traps which are in the form of monsters that activate from your hand by discarding themselves to the graveyard. And the main ones which I want to focus on, or the best ones, are Artifact Lancia, Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, Draw and Lot Bird, Effect Vela, and Ghost Ogre Snow Rabbit. These aren't the only hand traps in the game and um, there are definitely more others, particularly for the Ghost Sister, uh, uh, they're not really an archetype, but the Ghost Sisters, such as Ghost Bell, Ghost Reaper, and Ghost Sister. But these are the ones which you're probably going to most likely see people playing. Now, all of these cards, as I said, activate by discarding yourself from your uh, from your hand to the graveyard and to do, a, uh, to, uh, to do an effect. We have cards such as Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, which negate or uh, stop your opponent from doing a single action. Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring stops your opponent from adding a card from their deck to the hand, sending a card from the deck to the graveyard, and special summoning a card from the deck, or special summoning a card from their deck. The reason why Ash Blossom is easily the best hand trap in the game is because everybody wants to do one of those three things in order to access their engine better and set up their first turn board, so she's always pretty much always live. You can always get some use out of Ash Blossom no matter what matchup you're going up against and so that's why she's most often used in almost everyone's deck. Uh, other very uh, common cards to use are things like Effect Failure. Effect Failure can only be used during your opponent's main phase, however you can discard it and negate a face up effect monster your opponent controls. A uh, very very powerful effect but also the fact that she's only in the main phase is why she doesn't always see a whole lot of play. Uh, so she's very powerful, but also has a bit of restriction to it. Uh, once upon a time, Ghost Ogre was used almost everywhere, but nowadays she's not used as much. How Ghost Ogre works is when a card is on the field, activates its effect, such as a spell, or trap, or even a monster effect. Something that's faced up in the field that has already that uses its effect is used. You could discard this card and destroy it. This can be very useful for disrupting boards, um, people that are trying to build that people are trying to build up and taking away a resource from them. Whereas Effect Failure stops the effect, it doesn't get rid of the monster. Uh, Ghost Ogre doesn't stop the effect, but it gets rid of the monster. So uh, they're both kind of uh, uh, different uh, different sides of the same coin. Um, however, both of these don't, are not very relevant against every single deck. So they can be used sparingly. Other style hand traps are more Floodgate style hand traps such as Draw and Bird and Artifact Lancia where when you activate them, they stop your opponent from doing a certain action for the rest of the turn. Lancia stops players from banishing cards for the rest of the turn, whereas Draw and Lockbird stops your opponent from adding cards from the deck to the hand for the rest of the turn. These can be very, very powerful, but then there's also going to be certain strategies where they're just no good against them, which is why people will often have these cards sided as opposed to being played in the main deck. You might not really see people in Legacy of the Duelist playing this in online ranked because they're only single game formats, but there are definitely going to be matchups where you're going to wish you had these cards because they, if otherwise your opponent is just going to pop off and do some crazy stuff which you're just not going to be able to deal with. Now the common thread between all of these cards is that they all activate by discarding themselves from your hand to the graveyard and therefore they are all vulnerable to a counter and the counter we're going to talk about is Called by the Grave. Called by the Grave is a two year old card which activates uh, by saying target one monster in your opponent's graveyard Banish it, and if you do until the end of the next turn, its effects are negated, as well as the activated effects and effects on the field of monsters with the same original name. So it's a very, very powerful card where you simply say, your opponent activates Ash Blossom against you, you say, no thank you, I'm going to play Call by the Grave and get rid of your Ash Blossom from your graveyard, and then also negate it. 
Please keep in mind that this act this lasts not only for the rest of the turn, but the rest of the, until your opponent's next turn. So if you are also playing Ash Blossom or something similar in your deck, you cannot use it for the next two turns in game time. So just be aware of that. Cool by the Grave is a very versatile card as well, where you don't only have to use it against hand traps. Anything that tries to use a card and move a card from the graveyard to another location can also be hit by Cool by the Grave. Let's say for example your opponent plays monster reborns and targets a monster. You can chain Call by the Grave, get rid of that target, and then they can't actually summon it to the field. So it's a very, very versatile card, and um, definitely should consider using this if you are worried about your opponent using one of these effects against you. Another card which is kind of easy to use and kind of accessible, but not every single deck will be able to use this, is Instant Fusion. And Instant Fusion can be used to summon out Millennium Eyes Restrict. Millennium Eyes District is a monster effect style version of Call by the Grave in that um, when your opponent activates an effect monster, you can target an effect monster in their graveyard uh, that your opponent controls or actually in their graveyard, it could be the field or the graveyard, and you can equip it to this card. And while equipped to this card, uh, all effects of that monster will be negated. So um, similarly like Call by the Grave, if your opponent activates any of these cards, you can say Millennium Eyes Restrict, gobble, 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 suck it all up, and then you get to equip it to it. The downside with this, of course, is because of its infusion, this monster will be destroyed, but this could be all you need in order to kind of do your own combo and set off without having to worry about dealing or having to play through things like Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring. So it is a consideration. The other downside with this as well, though, is that you need to have it in your extra deck and you might not have space in your extra deck for this card. So um, definitely consider it if you can, but if you can't, um, then you know it is what it is you have to just do the best you can now while these counters work really well against these hand traps they do absolutely nothing for these ones and these are effects that activate on the field from your opponent's hand as opposed to going into the graveyard and we have the Cyframe gear gamma package uh, infinite impermanence and also Nibiru the primal being the Cyframe gear gamma package is easily by far and large the best monster effect hand trap in the game if you want to stop your opponent from doing some kind of crazy monster effect, Cyframe Gear Gamma will get the job done. However, Gamma is a double-edged sword. In order to use Gamma, you must have no cards on your field. So after turn 1 recent, re really, you can't really use this card. So it's either you have no cards in the field, and or you have cards on the field and you can't use it. Also, in order to use Cyframe Gear Gamma's effect, you must be able to special summon this card as well as summon Cyframe Driver. Now, Cyframe Driver can be special summoned from your hand, deck, or graveyard, uh, which isn't too bad, but you have to give up space in your deck to play this vanilla monster, which really isn't going to do much unless you're actually playing a strategy around it, uh, which is kind of a disadvantage. Uh, so, what people end up doing is they usually play three copies of Cyframe Gear Gamma, so they hope to draw this card before drawing a Cyframe Driver. That way you can get it out of your deck as opposed to drawing it and summoning it from your hand. The also final downside of this package is that when you summon Cyframe Gear Gamma, uh, during the end phase, if nothing's happened to Gamma and Driver, they haven't been destroyed by battle or, I don't know, uh, Super Poly the way or something like that, then they will banish themselves in the end phase. This means you lose a Driver and you lose a Gamma and you end up in your, with your deck two more Gammas that you just really can't use. So be aware of that. Um, um, it can be a bit of a bricky card, but it's by far and large the most one of the most powerful cards in the game. And if you're playing against an insane combo deck where you know if I don't stop them now, I won't be able to win or play the game at all, then it's worth the risk and it's worth playing that. Uh, we also have, similar to that, on that sense, Nibiru the Primal Being. Nibiru the Primal Being is less than a year old. He actually came out only last year's summer and it's a fantastic card for them. Nibiru the Primal Being says that during the main phase, if your opponent summons or normal summons, special or normal summon, five or more monsters this turn, you can tribute as many face up monsters on the field as possible. And if you do, special summon this card from your hand. It is a kaiju on crack. It is literally a board wipe to say, listen, you are going too, too nuts with all these monsters. Let's wipe the board and start again. Um, Nibiru gives your opponent a token. And the token that they get uh, has the attack and combined attack and defense of all the monsters that were tributed. So it can leave them with a big beefy monster. But ideally what you want to do is summon that token in defense so they can't actually attack with it that turn. And then you can maybe get over that monster later on. The Biru the Primal Being is a very very powerful card. And 
um, against combo style strategies, it can absolutely just ruin their day. Certain decks literally can't play through Nibiru at all and therefore are no longer relevant thanks to this card. The best decks though can play through Nibiru so do be aware of that, it isn't the beat be or an end all. And of course some decks just can ignore Nibiru because they don't care about summoning a bunch of monsters, uh, they're more back row heavy like Autogeist or something. The final uh, card that activates on the field that we're going to talk about is Infinite Impermanence. Infinite Permanence is a trap card and activates from your deck to the field and it works just like a vet failure where you target a monster on the field and negate its effect. Infinite Impermanence is very very powerful because one it can't be hit by call by the grave and two it can be used uh, from your hand if you control no cards kind of like Cyframe Gear Gamma. Uh, whilst, it, um, whilst that also might seem like a restriction because it is a trap card you can easily set this card while you have cards on the field as well and if you set this card then choose to activate it not only will it negate a uh, monster effect that you target on the field but it also negates all spells and trap cards in the same column that this card activated in which can be relevant in many many matchups the amount of times i've seen people uh, use infinite impermanence and then their opponent activate a card a spell trap card in the same column later on is hilarious and every time i see it i love it because they didn't realize or remember that uh impermanence negates all effects uh, all spell trap card effects in that column until the rest of the for the rest of the turn so it is a very, very powerful card and is, a, is one you will often see people use them. These cards, of course, are not without their counters, but the counters are a little bit less easier to use. Uh, we have uh, on board monster effect negation, such as Kawaki Meru Guardian, which if you are playing a deck that doesn't run out of their normal summon, you can normal summon a card like this. And any time a monster effect is activated, you will be able to tribute this card and negate it. So this says no Nibiru for you, no Cyframe Gamma. Um, this is literally a wall against those cards. Um, so the downside, of course, is not many people are playing rock-based decks, and also it's it takes up your normal summon to do so. Also, if you don't negate a monster effect with this card uh, during the end phase, it's going to destroy itself unless you reveal another rock monster in your hand or an Iron Core of Kawaki Miru. So it's a bit unwieldy. There are other types of de uh, uh, in archetype based effect negation cards as well. So there are things that come to mind, uh, Mythical Beast Jackal King for Pendulum decks. So whatever works with your strategy kind of works, but these effects will outright stop your opponent from using Gear Gamma and Nibiru against you. Um, also, there are link based cards such as Appalooza, Bow of the Goddess. Appalooza is a very powerful card and is literally the anti Nibiru card. She's a link 4 monster, which means if you summon her as your 5th card, she will come onto the field with a, an onboard form of effect negation, which means when you are, when, once you've reached 5 monsters, your opponent can choose to deactivate Nibiru, but she will be there ready to negate it for you. Now of course, in order to use Appaloosa really well, you have to have a deck which can extend beyond this, because you cannot rely on Appaloosa alone to do all the work for you. So if you're playing a combo style deck which can kind of play uh, play more after the Appaloosa and get more effects than all the power to you, you can stop a Nibiru and then also build your board. But if not, um, then this may not be the strategy for you. Also on the topic of Nibiru, you can actually make use of the token. It is a very, very big token normally that you get. So I've won games by my opponent using Nibiru against me that I turn the token to attack and swing for game and it's really really fun to do so. But in case you don't want to have a token on board, you can have a card like Link Spider in your extra deck so you can use it as a material to summon something else out. Particularly uh, if you need say effect monsters on the board and not normal monsters on the board, you could turn it into an effect monster like Link Spider and then use it as a resource to kind of link climb further into your deck. Last but not least, you also have cards like Prohibition, which is starting to see some play recently in uh, the TCG meta. However, it's it's a bit of a brick, so um, you know it's a uh, it's up to you if you want to use it or not. Uh, Prohibition is an old school card that says activate by decaying one card name. No one can use that card. Simple. Um, if your strategy has very very few outs to it, let's say you're playing a combo based deck strategy that only loses to say super polymerization or can only be defeated by Nibiru then maybe it might be worth including a couple of copies of this card in your deck and saying, okay, no one can use that effect, now I'm just going to do what I want to do and I'm not scared. Uh, however, it cannot um, against most decks, you cannot always know what your opponent's going to use, and particularly in game one uh, on, turn, on turn one, you're not going to know what card deck your opponent's using, so it's a bit difficult to use this card. But certain decks can do, and those that can do don't have to worry about cards like these. So guys, that's a really quick description and discussion on the types of um, disruption people are going to be playing 
to kind of stop you from building up too strong of a board on turn one. I want to quickly switch over to some online match footage now and kind of show some examples of myself uh, playing through Disruption as well. So we're going to have a look at some online footage here now and I'm going to be playing my Orcus deck against an opponent in online ranked. So what we're going to do first is we're going to try and break down the quality of my hand and say how vulnerable it is to act, uh, to any disruption. Uh, first of all I could tell you that looking at my opening hand here is I have two bricks already. Uh, the first card being the Beard of Primal Beard, I cannot use this turn. And also I have Orchestrated Return on my right hand side which also I cannot really use this turn. Uh, because I currently do not have the requisite card in order to activate the effect. Now, looking at my other three cards, I have two copies of Scrap Recycler, which is great. Scrap Recycler is a, a fantastic one card opener and can definitely get me into my engine. However, I only have one normal summon per turn, which means one of these cards I will be able to use and the other I cannot use. That means out of my five cards, I have three dead cards that I cannot use. And while that might not be the end of the world, if my opponent has five cards they can use in their first turn and I only have two, guess who's more likely to win? So, um, what we're, uh, having a look at my cards here, I only have Scrap Recycler and I have Cool by the Grave. Now I want to have a look at a quick bit of math and uh, discuss what is the probability chance of my opponent actually having any interruption in their hand. So on average in my experience, players run about six to eight hand traps in their main deck uh, going blind. Uh, this of course can vary greatly depending on the deck they're playing. I've seen players run no hand traps and say hand traps are for pussies. I've seen players run 12 hand traps in their deck. It doesn't really matter. We go by what the average normally is and that's normally about 6 to 8 cards dedicated in their deck to uh, be disruption on the first turn. So if your opponent is optimistically running about 6 cards in their main deck as hand traps, the chance of them drawing 1 when they're going second and you're going first is 57 percent actually if you round this up it's 58 um, percent if they have dedicated eight slots in their deck to be in hand traps the chances of them drawing one goes up to 69 percent which is in my opinion both of these numbers are quite high uh, we're talking about kyber taking over kyber corp numbers we're talking about greater than 51 percent so I would definitely make sure that my ratios are well enough to kind of combat and deal with this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back into the footage and we're going to see did my opponent open with a hand trap. So as the probability numbers are suggested, yes, my opponent had, was very likely to have a hand trap in their hand and the one they had was Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, which can absolutely negate Scrap Recycler and stop me from getting into my engine. Fortunately, of course, I have called by the Grave to protect my Scrap Recycler and negate his Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, but if I didn't have that, this hand would be completely dead. In fact, if this was an Ash Blossom and in fact a card like Infinite Impermanence, there would have been nothing I could have done to stop my opponent negating my normal summon and uh, stopping me from popping off this turn. So uh, this is hopefully uh, just an example of why it's very important to kind of be prepared to play through different forms of disruption against another opponent. Now what about the rest of his cards? How likely is it that his last four cards are also going to be a form of disruption that you need to worry about? Do I need to run more copies of Call by the Grave? How worried should I realistically be? Well let's look at some numbers here to kind of answer that question for us. So here are the probability numbers for if your opponent manages to have two hand traps as opposed to one in their opening hand. If your opponent plays roughly six hand traps in their main deck, the chances of them drawing two of them is only 15%, which is a major drop down from 58%. If they have eight hand traps in their main deck, this number becomes 25%, which uh, still is quite low in my personal opinion. Um, you know, of course there are going to be times when your opponent has every single hand trap that they need in their opening hand and they're going to have every single way and form to break your board and they're going to be able to ruin your day and it's going to be an important tournament, you're going to be in the finals and you're going to lose it all at the last minute. It is what it is, it happens to everyone all the time. However, when the numbers are this low, I consider them to be quite negligible because they're actually really so much in your favour. So, while I always say you should be prepared for one form of disruption, especially uh, in the form of a hand trap from your opponent, two or more, you know, becomes, you know, it, it's really hard to say or, or to justify whether uh, you should really be prepared for more than just, uh, just the one of that. 
So, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video and hope uh, you've enjoyed a bit more of an advanced look at playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Since uh, I've become a professional player myself, I've learned so much more about this game and how things work. And I kind of want to share that with you and those who follow me on this channel. Uh, what I would like to do in my next advanced style video is I want to talk a bit more about deck building. I want to kind of go into these terms that I've been discussing in my deck profiles of what makes a star extender uh, and how the uh, how grouping cards into uh, groups of their roles as opposed to just once a person traps can lead us to debt building, better debt building ratios and uh, how that works out using probability. So I kind of want to do that for the advanced talk. If you guys are interested in hearing a video a bit more about how to build a deck better, do let me know in the comments down below. I'll be happy to make one for you and uh yeah so guys i hope you enjoyed this video thank you for tuning in as always if you want to challenge me or when you're playing against me add me on psn at standby main and uh, if you want to be in a video as well i lo i love showcasing other people and their deck profiles so if you have a decent microphone discord or psn whatever you are preferred for what communication is and you want to show something off let me know and i'll be glad to try and make this some time to kind of uh, meet up with you and do so so guys thank you very much for tuning into this video i'll see you soon take care